Hello, and welcome to the D'Agostini Model Space Paint the Millennium Falcon with me, Steve Dimzo, not you, me. And this is part two, so if you have not seen part one, go back and watch part one because this won't make any sense to you. So come on back and join us for part two. If you did see part one, then stick around because this is part two, you're in the right place. Pairing the prototype required quite a bit of work. So you can see here, this is a production cockpit up to this point, but this is the SLA resin from this direction over. So I had to graft these two together, which uh, they didn't want to go, but it made them go, stay. And then as you look over here, all of this upper deck is actually the SLA resin uh, because I didn't get any of the production parts yet. But this piece actually is an ABS plastic piece, so I was able to use this, but I had to use a couple of the little SLA parts that came with the resin and pop them off and reattach them. So that was done. Um, pretty much everything else that you see, except for some of the piping that was replaced, is SLA resin. Most of the production plastic was utilized on the underside of the model. Now, when I say painting, I just want to be clear. This is a prototype model, and as such, it's not perfect, and it's not going to match the production pieces exactly. As I received this, there was quite a bit of damage. A lot of the pipes were missing. Quite a few of the small surface details had popped off or are completely gone. I repaired it as best I could, but please don't scrutinize this if you see it in public or at a convention or in a commercial somewhere. It's not 100% yet, but the primary focus of these videos is to talk about using this as a canvas to paint and apply all the different weathering and damage techniques. So we're gonna be focusing on that and not on every little tiny greebly on the model. So don't worry about those. We're gonna focus on the painting. So keep that in mind. This safety tip public announcement brought to you by D'Agostini and Model Space. Makers of giant models since like the 1800s. But seriously, I'm not kidding. They've been around since like Abraham Lincoln was president or something. And now this PSA. Important safety tip number one involves the ship's flaps. They are molded as separate parts on your model kit. But if you glue them down first, painting and masking and finishing this area will be very difficult. Generally a big pain in the nugget. So leave them off, paint the colors, and then apply them. It will save you lots of time and frustration. Safety tip number two involves the rear engine. The model comes with a clear plastic part. Don't forget to tape over it first, because if you don't, when you paint the model, it will be the same color as the model. Safety tip number three involves the center disc assembly and gun turret. The instructions tell you to screw it to the die cast frame that's underneath. But if you do that, this part will be a pain in the noogies to get off. So leave those screws off. The other great thing about leaving this assembly unattached is, if you'd like to come back later and put things in here, you can. Like small animals, additional lighting, or even if you just want to hide money from your wife. Let's face it, she's never going to look inside here. <laughs> I think we should take a minute to talk about how we're going to paint the model. To that end, I've constructed an FSRM, or Falcon Rotational Support Module. It consists of several components, one of which is the box, as some people refer to them, but it's actually the bilateral occipital exo support structure. The box is somewhat complicated, but I'll try to explain it to you. First, I drew it in CAD. Then I took the STL file over to the machine shop, where they CNC'd it out of a solid block of cardboard. I heard somewhere that you can buy boxes online and in stores, but I don't know. I prefer to make my own. I just think they work better that way. Here we have the prototype. It's all repaired. It's been epoxied, glued together. Um, I have a couple coats of primer on it, and I have about four coats of our handy dandy Tamiya AS20 Insignia White. And I used about one and a half cans to do the top and the sides. Um, the color is fairly translucent, so you will have to apply several coats. And in this case, I had to hide a lot of the existing weathering that wouldn't come off with the paint thinner. So I applied a little more than I normally would. But it wasn't too bad at all, about a half, one and a half cans. So now 
our palette is ready to begin painting. We're going to begin masking off the model and we're going to start at the very front of the model where the headlights are. So to do that, we're going to use Silly Putty because I like using Silly Putty. It works as a really good masking medium. It doesn't stick to the model and it's very easily removed. Here's the Silly Putty. I get it at the dollar store for a dollar. And uh, you may remember it from your childhood. You can stick it on comic books and things and make copies. But it's really, really good as a masking agent because it makes pretty sharp lines. You can press it on different things and airbrush and it pops right off and it doesn't stick and it doesn't leave a residue. So love me some Silly Putty. The other key thing that we're going to use for masking is the Tamiya masking tape. And we use a bunch of different size. They have a six millimeter, this is, I don't know, three quarters of an inch or something. We use that for putting directly on the colored areas to mask them off. But then I back it with painter's tape because um, it's not as sticky as regular masking tape. And unfortunately the edges that you get on a regular tape roll that you get at a hardware store generally aren't sharp enough for what we're gonna do. But the Tamiya makes a razor sharp line. So generally I use these in combination to mask off so we don't get overspray from the airbrush onto other areas. Before you start masking the model to paint it, you need to know what you're painting. Um, so you need good reference information. As we talked about in the last part, part one, um, colors vary and things change from monitor settings and photographs and printers and all that kind of thing. So we have color corrected set of photographs, which you will be getting as part of the deal with the Augustini. They will be put somewhere for you guys. Here I've printed out a number of the photographs that we took back at the archive in 2003, and I'm using these as reference for painting. But if you don't want to spend $3,000 on toner like I did and print these, you can also use an iPad or a tablet. And I just transferred all the files onto the iPad. And in that way, you've got it right there. You can handle it easily. And if you need to check a spot, you can zoom in and look around and see what you got and then go like that. So the combination of the iPad, the computer monitor, and the printed photographs generates enough reference that you can get the model pretty accurate. I want to take a moment to talk about display options here. As designed, the kit allows you to either display the model with the landing gear in place and you can set it on a tabletop or you can close the landing gear bay doors up and you can mount it to the wall mount which you'll be getting later on and the wall mount includes several bolts that will attach to a metal plate and then you can hang it on a wall but there's this hole here so if you're only going to use the landing gear and not use the wall mount, you may want to fill those in because obviously this detail doesn't appear on the filming miniature. However, if you think you are going to be using the wall mount, don't fill those in because you won't be able to use it ever again if you do that. So just wanted to point that out right up front here. So here's another neat little detail if you'd like to get crazy with your model. Um, they will definitely be molded into the surface on the production model and they were on the prototype but I drilled them out so I could show you this little trick. What are these things? These two holes are actually drilled and tapped for 832 set screws and this one is a 440 button head allen screw in black. Why are they there? Apparently when ILM removed this and there's a second one on the underside this cap would come off, ditto on the other side, and then steel mounting rods would be inserted through here, and then these set screws would be tightened down to grab onto the rods. And that way the model could be mounted from the front so they could film the back of the model in an action shot. So if you want to do that on your model, it's a rather simple thing to do. You just drill and tap for 832 on there, and you drill and tap for 440 there, and you go to a local hardware store or something like McMaster Car, and you can buy these little thingies for fairly cheap and stick them in. This whole thing took maybe 10 minutes to do, so it's 
kind of a neat little detail, and you can show it off to your friends, and they'll be impressed, I think. Here we've masked off about 75% of the model. I want to take this point to mention the cockpit in particular. Two points about the cockpit. You want to leave it unattached for right now and just press fit in place. And I know you're saying to yourself, but Steve, I want to glue my cockpit on. I'm telling you not to glue your cockpit on and you need to listen to me, okay? Here's why. Number one, if you don't glue it on, you can put this cool stuff inside to protect the interior from getting paint on it. But number two, as you mentioned in part one, we're going to give you a replacement cockpit. So if you glue this one on, you won't be able to get the new one on. So don't do it. I don't care what you say. Just don't. Here's an example of one of the first areas we're going to spray. We've masked off the panels with the Tamiya tape. And one interesting point is, on the ILM model, they didn't actually follow all the little notch outs and everything. They just put the tape in a straight line. And very often, they actually didn't follow the panel lines. Sometimes the tape goes over the panel line or it skips a panel line. So you have to decide whether you want to make it movie accurate or not. I just follow the panel lines just to be neat. But when you get your reference pictures, you will note that some of the lines are quite a bit off. We're airbrushing the first color, which is a mixture of gunship gray, light ghost gray, a little bit of semi-flat black, and some paint thinner. You can mix up your own color to taste. Mileage may vary. Not insured in the state of California. Okay. I'm gonna pray, spray these panels, just undercoat them. They get a rust red color on them, but I'm gonna undercoat them with the gray so that the color is a little bit denser when I spray the red on. It just gives it a nice base to spray upon. So there you go. And this is gonna change a little bit anyway because there's oversprays on top of these, as with pretty much every panel on this entire model. There's gonna be some oversprays of body color and some black and some rust and blah, 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 blah. So this isn't the final color anyway, but it's a good starting base to start from. Quick airbrush safety tip. Use Model Master paint thinner or something similar to thin your paint. Don't use turpentine because turpentine is composed of gum spirits. And like the title says, it will gum up your airbrush and you'll be cleaning it for the rest of your natural life. So use a quality airbrush cleaner thinner. It will save you a lot of time and grief at the end of the day. As you can see here, there's kind of a mosaic of panels that we've completed in several shades of gray. And the interesting thing, which is good for us, is ILM wasn't super ultra careful about how they mask some of the panels off. Uh, especially along these curvatures, they rarely made a perfect radius. They just sort of did it. Um, so I just sort of did it. It's not a perfect exact circle, but you'll notice as you paint panels on this model, they do radiate out from a central point. So anytime you paint these panels, they have to follow that angle back to the center point, which is the central core of the model. So ILM did that, so that's the pattern that we want to follow. So you'll notice overspray. In some places I'm going to clean it up, but in a lot of places it's exactly what they did. They weren't super ultra clean about that either, and that's one of the big factors that contributes to the overall look of the filming miniature. Whether you see it or not, your brain registers it. So it's good for us because we can be a little bit messy and still be accurate, which is great. We're going to talk about one panel now in particular, which will represent some of the other ones. Here I've laid down the base color, which is a fairly dark gray, but in general, you want to go from darker to lighter as you work your way up in the color spectrum. To that end, I've laid down a fairly dark gray color, which is a bluish gray. Now I know what you're saying. Steve, that gray is really dark. That's too dark. You painted that wrong. Hold on. What were you saying? What? What did you say? I can't hear you. What? Oh, look at that. And then we're going to overspray it with another color later. So as you will see, as we move forward, every time you look at something on this model, you're actually looking at four or five layers. I know I've said that a bunch of times, but I can't say it enough. It is an important detail that we need to learn how to emulate if you want to make the model look exactly like the filming miniature. I'd like to take a moment to talk a little bit about color theory. It is a subject that I keep banging into the ground, and yes, the horse is dead and flat. 
but it is important and I think we need to discuss it just one more time. Um, first off, 7% of all Amer American males are colorblind. So that's something to keep in mind, fun fact. Um, fun fact number two, gray absorbs the color next to it. And we're gonna take a look at that. We're gonna pop up a little image on the screen so you can see that, but it really, really does change with what's next to it. So we have to keep that in mind as we paint this model. You're probably asking yourself, why isn't Steve using the original Floquil colors that ILM used? I read somewhere on the internet that ILM used Floquil colors. And if it's on the internet, it must be true. Um, I will explain why I'm mixing my own colors. While that is actually correct, that they did use Floquil for a lot of the painting on the filming miniatures, the Floquil paint that was created in 1976-77 is nothing like the, the paint that's created now. Obviously, it's been reformulated. Most of the paint companies have gone to more environmentally friendly paints, so they don't have the nasty, great solvents like they, they had back in 1976. And the colors have actually changed slightly. Um, for example, the color caboose red and boxcar red were used in the Floquil paint line back in 76 by ILM, but those colors are not the same colors today that they were back then. So it's just really not a big deal to mix your own colors, especially since for the seven millionth time, they're going to be layered, so they're going to change slightly anyway. And actually, on a lot of the panels, we're going to go over them with some sandpaper because they love to sand them too. So as soon as you start scratching them up with the sandpaper, that's going to change the color again. If you have good reference, which we will supply to you, you'll be able to see this stuff up close. In a lot of the imagery that I've seen on the internet and in books, you can't see some of that detail. But I can tell you, as someone who spent a week with the filming miniature and looked at it like this, I can tell you that this kind of thing is true and, and you just have to trust me. Please trust me. As I mentioned earlier, I recommended to paint the model with the Tamiya Insignia white lacquer and let it dry for a day. And now I'm going to show you a little example of why it's a good idea. While it's not absolutely the end-all, be-all, must-do, it does come in handy once in a while. Like, look, oh my god, my hand's out of control. I can't stop. Oh no, what have I done? I've ruined the model. Ah! Now I have to go back to set one and rebuild it all over again and throw this one away. No, you don't. Hold on a second. Watch this. I put some thinner on a, a rag, and I'm just going to go like this. Gone! Okay. So see, if you spray it with the lacquer, if you goof up, you can fix it very easily. If you goof up 20 times, you can still fix it very easily. So that's why I recommend the lacquer. Now we're gonna answer some fan mail. John in Sheboygan writes, you had mentioned that ILM used a lot of original model kit parts to build the original filming miniature, but there's lots of seam lines all over those parts. On the model kit that we're building now, should we remove those seam lines? That's a very good question, John. Actually, no, you shouldn't, and here's why. On the original model, ILM didn't take a lot of time to clean the parts up, and you can actually see in very close-up pictures, you can see the, the molding gates, and you can definitely see the lines of separation, or mold lines, on a lot of the parts. They did not clean those up, so for accuracy's sake, if you want to be completely authentic, leave them on your model because the mold parts and the, the seams will be very similar to the original kit parts on this model, and so they'll be very authentic. If you want to be more theoretical and do an as-if falcon, you can remove them and clean them up, but I'm definitely going to leave them on mine. Todd from the Hamptons writes in and says, I'm a beginning modeler and not very good at painting, and I don't have a lot of experience. Can I still build this model and make it look good? That's also a very good question. Actually, you can. There is quite a bit of artwork pre-done on the model, and a lot of the parts have washes and paint treatments already. So you still can build the kit as it comes to you, um, pretty much unpainted, and still have a respectable looking model. But obviously, the more paint work that you do, the closer you get to the filming miniature. It's a matter of personal taste, so just have fun with it. Scooter from Toad Suck Arkansas writes in, I see that on the kit, the panels overlap. 
Should I glue those together? Well, you don't have to because it's pretty strong as it's supplied. But on my personal model and on the prototype, I am gluing the panel sections together. And in some places, I'm actually gluing the panels to the die cast frame as well, just to give it a little more structural stability. Buford from Boogertown, North Carolina. Boogertown, North Carolina, seriously? Now you're just messing with me. Writes in and says, in part one, you told us that we shouldn't use solvent type cements on the ABS model kit parts. But I have successfully used commercially available solvents on ABS models in the past. I have also used MEK and other very, very strong solvents for many years and it has not affected me and it hasn't affected me or me either. Um, all right, so he's right. Um, you can use solvent type cements on this model and you were right and I was less right. Um, but I will continue to use the ACC type adhesives just because that's my experience, but certainly use whatever works best for you. As you study the reference pictures, you'll notice that there are a number of red rectangles, or orangey rectangles with red borders, on the surface of the model in about seven or eight places. This is one of them. So I'm not sure how ILM did it. It looks like they were just freehand painted, and you could probably do the same thing and draw the border in with a very sharp red pen or a sharpened Sharpie. Um, since I had a time constraint to get this project done, I had dry transfers custom made, and I'm gonna use that to apply to the model because I had to deliver this by a certain date. Since you don't have that time constraint, you'll have a little more time to apply them with hand painting and bordering them with a pen. Well, campers, that ends part two of our series. But fret not, we will be back with part three. And in that part, we're going to cover some more panel detailing, shading, and getting into those all characteristic blast marks and oil streaks and stains and all that stuff that makes the Millennium Falcon the Millennium Falcon, the biggest hunk of junk in the galaxy. So we're gonna cover that in the next part. So make sure you come back. It's gonna be just absolutely fantastic. You're gonna love it. See you later.